Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, as Minnesota students are back in the classroom, a key Republican lawmaker describes why a new law impacting school resource officers must be changed. And the DFL Education Chair highlights new policies impacting teachers and students. Stay tuned for this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. Senate and House Republicans, along with school officials and law enforcement officers, recently called for the repeal of a new law that restricts school resource officers from using certain physical restraints on students. The consequences of the new law that is concerning, that you have heard about and you will hear more about this morning, that is being pushed through our schools, it is actually pushing our school resource officers out of the districts such as Moorhead, Anoka, Coon Rapids, Andover, Rockford, Redwood Falls, St. Louis County, and others that are still making their decisions. Under the current law, there are questions regarding the role of SROs, which restricts their ability to use force or use of restraints. The potential impact to Centennial is the possibility of our school resource agreements being suspended and SROs being pulled out of our schools. In turn, this may have an impact on the safety and security measures in place at our schools. The only time force is acceptable is when there is a threat of bodily harm or death. Okay? There's a lot of situations that come up where the threat of bodily harm or death may not be immediate, but they are an escalating situation. Some examples of that may be, um, this, let's say there's a student who's been expelled who's trespassing or at a football game. We may have three, four, five, six officers working at a football game. We have students that are being disorderly, maybe throwing bottles out on the field, um, causing a ruckus. Generally, what we will try to do is get them to leave um, or tr trespass them from the school property. Um, we cannot do that physically. We actually would have to call officers in off the street who are governed by other rules in this statute to manage that situation then. So the cops are calling the cops. When I hear the chief come up here and describe the fact that he and other agencies are having to look at workarounds, are having to try to establish police patrolling zones rather than having SROs in buildings where they can immediately defuse situations, keep people safe, and deter and prevent instances from escalating. That's what we're talking about here. That's what we want to reset to. Joining me now in the studio is the lead Republican for the Senate Education Policy Committee, Senator Zach Duckworth. Welcome. Thanks for having me. For the sake of our viewers, explain the role of a school resource officer, a general overview of who they are and what they do. Sure. Uh, so school resource officers have been in many schools throughout the state of Minnesota for decades. Uh, they partner with the school administrators and staff to help students succeed, make sure the school buildings are safe, and meet the needs of both students and staff. That could be anything from handling emergencies to uh, giving classes on uh, the side effects or harmfulness of drugs. It could be helping to identify those that are in need of mental health resources. It could also be addressing behavioral issues. The, the bottom line is school resource officers exist and are in school buildings buildings to keep kids, teachers, and the schools safe. And often they do that by building very strong relationships with those in those buildings to prevent things from even happening. A new provision in law attempts to set a strict standard whereby use of force or certain restraints cannot be used on students except under extreme circumstances. Are law enforcement officials telling you that the new law goes too far and that at times they do need to have the use of these restraints as an option. Sure. Uh, the thing I've heard from most law enforcement officials isn't necessarily that the law goes too far. In fact, they say they, they don't want to harm kids at all. That's not why they got into law enforcement. They got in to serve and protect kids of all people. What they are saying is that it's unclear. There's ambiguity there that they need to get uh, resolved. And unfortunately, because the, the law as it stands isn't clear, many of them have had to be pulled out of buildings. So the request or the ask is simple. Add clarity to the law so they can return those school resource officers to those buildings and prevent others from having to be pulled out. Um, I can't underscore the importance of folks understanding law enforcement, police, they don't want to harm your kids. They want to protect them and they are more protected when these school resource officers are in those school buildings. 
My understanding is that police officers who are not school resource officers are able to use rest restraints under you know circumstances that require because they are governed by a different set of standards. This law change applies specifically to people who work in schools. Is the rationale that school resource officers should then be more like you know community service people or neighborhood watch people so they don't necessarily have the same authority as police but are there as a calming presence and then police would be called if it were warranted? Uh, I, I don't know for certain if that is the exact rationale. I'll put it to you this way. Um, I am an optimist. I like to believe everybody is well intended and I would say perhaps that is the intention of the law to still have school resource officers there or nearby so they can help uh, if, there, if an emergency were to arise. Um, but I think uh, we'd be kidding ourselves if we didn't also understand that some folks simply don't want school resource officers, law enforcement in school buildings, uh, which I personally think is, is the wrong answer. And here's the deal. If a school district doesn't want that relationship currently, they can decide not to have it. We don't need to mandate that at the state level. Okay? Um, but what school resource officers do do is, you know, when seconds matter, they step in and they provide safety, oftentimes preventing and deterring something from even escalating. I think if you go back uh, to 2020 or 21, there was an incident specifically in Minnesota in which a school resource officer intervened and clearly prevented a situation from escalating, which could have been very detrimental. Uh, and here's the other thing. We don't know how many things haven't occurred because a, resource, a school resource officer was in a building or nearby. And that's a scary thing to think about, but at the end of the day, we know if they're there, our schools, kids, teachers will be safer without a question. Are school resource officers trained similarly to police officers, but they just have a mission that's slightly different? Yeah, so many, many school resource officers have been former law enforcement officers that you would think of in the typical uh, role or of their assignments and duties, and now they've been assigned to a school. So they're highly trained. Uh, they know what they, they can and can't do. And then they've also received specialized training specific to working in the school. And a lot of that has to do with de-escalating, identifying potential issues, building relationships with students. And here's what people don't understand. Another role of school resource officers, they coach and mentor kids often who are in most need of that to keep them on the right path. There are so many students whose lives, whose stories could have been dramatically different had they not had a positive relationship and connection with the school resource officer. Folks, we don't want to see that go away in the state of Minnesota. We really don't. The concern over school resource officers provides perhaps a micro view of what is occurring in larger cities across the country. Uh, the desire among some citizens for tougher police action to may reign in crime while other citizens desire more community services to tackle crime. Uh, when it comes to schools where everyone does want teachers and students to be safe, is there a middle ground between these two approaches? I sure hope so. Uh, I think you just said it. Everybody wants to see our schools, our kids, and our teachers be as safe as possible. Uh, it, it's been a little disheartening to see um, stuff on social media or what have you that say, well, Democrats don't want our schools to be safe or Republicans in law enforcement just want to harm kids. Neither of those is true. Both Republicans and Democrats and our law enforcement, more importantly, moms and dads, want to see our schools safe. They want to see our kids safe. And I think if, if there's a middle ground that needs to be struck uh, regarding some obscure bill language to do that and to make sure school resource officers are there, we'll do it. This doesn't have to be partisan. As a matter of fact, it should be bipartisan. And we've had plenty of time to get the language ironed out that we need to every day that goes by when kids are in school is another day in which those schools are less safe. And they could be much safer, obviously. And so let's get it passed. Uh, let's do the right thing and get some clarity brought into the situation in a bipartisan manner so that we, we, we know exactly what kids and parents can expect. So you mentioned that your proposed legislation would repeal the new law restricting restraints and that it does have bipartisan support. Um, Attorney General Keith Ellison's office has said that the law change allows for the use of reasonable force, um, though his, some are saying that his statement is still unclear or ambiguous. Governor Tim Walz said he is open to a special session. He said that just over the weekend. So are you beginning to hear more, from more law, lawmakers whose school districts may be impacted? It seems that there's sort of a groundswell happening here. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I, that's kind of what I feel. I think we are seeing a, a groundswell, to use your term, of folks realizing, hey, uh, I think also, too, it has grown as more schools and districts have seen those school resource officers be removed from their buildings. At first, it was a handful. 
then it was a dozen, and now we're, I've lost count of how many have had them removed. So I think uh, phones are ringing, emails are being received, and, and here's what I'll say. You know, I, I ran to serve in the Senate because I felt it's important to be of service and bring about common sense change, and we have opportunities to do so. This is an example of that. It's not a Republican issue or a Democrat issue. This is a chance for all of us to come together on a common sense issue and do some bipartisan work. I think that's growing. Uh, the governor came out and said he's open to it. I know that I've worked with colleagues in the Senate who are genuinely interested in, in seeing a solution here. If we can get uh, House members, specifically Democrats in the House, to also be on board and work with us, we could have that language by the end of this week uh, passed via a special session, and we could have school resource officers back in schools in no time. And, and that's really what we need to do. And one more thing before I let you go, because we are back to school now. Everybody's kids are back in school. Uh, in late August, the Department of Education released testing data for 2023 that showed that in math and science, less than half of Minnesota students meet or exceed standards, while just over half, 50.4%, meet or exceed in reading. These are three key areas, and basically half of Minnesota students are still struggling. What would you like to see done to address this? Uh, sure, and I appreciate you asking the question because it's extremely important. Uh, as a former school board member, I would often say in meetings when we were looking at test scores and things of that nature that uh, nobody's here to beat up on anybody, right? I'm not here to criticize teachers, administrators, what have you. We need to look at where we stand, where our kids are, make some accurate assessments, and then move on from there. And that's the importance of these uh, results. To me, it underscores, uh, I think, something that you've probably heard from me, which uh, is a broken record, that we need to get back to the fundamentals, reading, writing, math, science. We spent this whole last session talking about education and passing all sorts of different mandates and ideas that now school districts and teachers are going to have to try to wade their way through. And everything that we ask of a teacher, everything that we require of a school district comes at a cost. Sometimes that's a literal cost, and other times it's a cost of time or attention or resources that get diverted from the very kids in the classroom who are our priority. When we're stacking more and more on top of teachers and school districts and superintendents and staff and our special ed folks, well, at some point something gives. And what begins to give is that time, attention, and the basic fundamental focus of academic success that our kids need in order to succeed. Uh, that, that would be my recommendation or, or my course of action is let's get rid of all the extra and let's just focus on what our kids so desperately need and those test results uh, clearly show us that that's the case. Senator Zach Duckworth, thank you. Thank you. For over two decades, the Minnesota Historical Society has offered the shadows and spirits of the state capitol tour. What will guests encounter on this tour? What we do is we recreate the historic lighting in the building as if you're walking into it for the first time in, early, in the early 1900s. And as you walk through these shadowy environs, you run into historical spirits or characters that would have been part of the stories of Minnesota's capital. On this tour, which spirits will guests encounter? Uh, there's a variety of different people from the building's past. For instance, Judson Bishop is a Civil War veteran who will tell his stories about his war experiences, and that's based upon those beautiful paintings of Civil War regiments uh, in the governor's reception room. We'll see uh, Clara Uland, who's a woman suffragist. Uh, she's talking about the right for women to vote and that, that march to getting that right eventually. And also in the Supreme Court, uh, where we're standing right now, we have the artist appears, and that's John Lafarge. She's the one who did these four murals that tell you the evolution, the changes of law throughout time. Does the tour cover the entire Capitol? It covers a lot of the different spaces that you would see on any regular tour. So we visit the rotunda, that's where the tour begins, go to the governor's reception room, go to the Senate, the House Gallery, get to see the chamber kind of from the bird's eye view, and then we come to the Supreme Court. What kind of feedback have you gotten over the years from people who've experienced this tour? Yeah, it's always very positive because you can come during the day to see our regular tours, and so you get one perspective of the building. But when you recreate the historic lighting, it really gives you a sense of what it would have looked like here 100 years ago. And uh, I think people are just thrilled to see these different stories being told, and it's really just a, a really fun way to look at the Capitol in a different light.
Minnesota students are back in the classroom just months after a legislative session that saw significant new policies signed into law and boosting of public school funding. Senator Steve Swadzinski is the chair of the Senate Education Policy Committee, and he joins me to talk about some of the changes coming to Minnesota's schools. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Governor Tim Walz has said he's open to calling a special session to either amend or repeal a new law that is prompting some police departments to pull school resource officers from schools due to concerns about the way the law is written. As both a former teacher and as a lawmaker, what are your thoughts on this issue and should the law be clarified and is it urgent? Oh, there's a lot going on in that question, Shannon. Um, so, okay, I did teach for 33 years. I'm a, um, I've realized the value that SROs have, school resource officers have in our schools. I think they, the relationship building and the mantra, the adage, you know, takes a village. I really, truly believe that police officers, along with educators, are part of that village. Um, so with all that said, though, however, I have found the last two weeks of my life so intellectually stimulating because we're, we're debating things like when it, what does imminent harm mean and what does reasonable versus unreasonable force mean. And uh, to me, the educator, it just, well, means what it means. And um, I'm finding out, no, all these different stakeholders, and I've talked to chiefs, chiefs of police, I've talked to the Minnesota Police um, Peace Officers Association, I've talked to um, school boards, I've talked to um, the League of Cities, and it's like, Everybody disagrees on the meaning of all those laws and um, all those words. And all I can tell people from my vantage point is you have my word. We will have a hearing um, the first two weeks of session. It's already, that's my plan, that's my vision. And I want to invite all the stakeholders to the table so that in a public forum, we can weigh in what we got right and what we got wrong on that particular bill. And. Um, and I think it's a good bill as is. I think it's just been interpreted maybe not as accurately as I would have thought the intent of the bill was. But SROs, if a school district wants to have them, they should be allowed to have them. And so, anyways. Okay. Well, in August, the Department of Education released testing data for 2023, which shows that roughly half of Minnesota kids are not meeting academic standards in math, reading, and science. I spent a little time uh, pulling up individual districts, districts across the state using the Minnesota report card, and every district that I looked at shows that fewer students are meeting or exceeding standards now than they were in 2019 before the pandemic. How do you view these results and perhaps what needs to happen to get kids back where they were before the pandemic? Oh, <laughs> oh there's a lot of work to be done. The pandemic, I think we're realizing um, my wife taught during the pandemic. All my colleagues that uh, when I left in 2016 are still teaching. They taught through the pandemic. We. Um, I think our kids suffered more than maybe anybody else, except for families that lost loved ones. Obviously, they suffered, took the biggest burden um, through COVID, but our kids suffered. Um, they really did. I don't know. I'm not pointing fingers at any decision makers that made the decisions they made about our schools, but nonetheless, the kids are hurting. They've suffered with mental health issues. They're struggling with, with um, social media issues, and, and I'm not surprised by those numbers going down, quite frankly. And and I think that our, our kids have, um, um, have lost their way, many. And many are doing just fine, but the, the numbers suggest many have lost their way. And, and we um, put a lot of money into mental health and counselors and social workers and school therapists. And hopefully the kids that need that help will, will realize, oh my God, I, I have this um, wonderful, wonderful life and I have a wonderful school. And, um, but right now I think a lot of kids are questioning um, what their what the meaning of life is, and um, they're, they're hurting. And I think that I don't know how a kid can um, be struggling with who they are and why they're here and do well on a test. And so I, I hope that the money we've spent on um, for counselors and social workers and the such um, and all that critical staff that our schools have um, will help raise those numbers. 
Uh, some changes passed in the last session will not begin until next year, like the personal finance and civics requirements that we've talked about. Um, but one new thing this year that I noticed is that students in 11th and 12th grade mm -hmm. can earn up to two elective credits now for working in long-term care or child care facilities. Is this to help with the workforce shortage in those two areas and to encourage students to consider these as viable career paths? I think that bill is a great idea. When, when I, I, I taught for 33 years. Uh, um, and one of the things I used to always tell my kids, don't let school get in the way of your education. And here's an opportunity to tell young people that are considering a field in um, memory care units and nursing homes and um, helping the elderly, um, give them the opportunity in, in high school to maybe earn a credit and, and help us with these shortages. My mom was just put into a memory care unit last year. I, I see the turnover. I mean, it's the, every month I go see her and, um, um, and it's hard. And because every time there's a different nurse, there's a different, but they, I've seen high school kids and college kids that are just there like helping and they're 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 so filled with um they make my mom feel special and um so i think this is a useful um thing to get kids out of the cells and bells of their classroom seats and maybe help with our elderly population and give them credit and hopefully teach them wow this is a viable option and uh, this will be my career path now i hesitate to admit this but as a kid, I had to stay in frequently during recess as punishment for talking during class. And I think I was just a kid who had a lot to say. Uh, because of new laws passed last session, recess detention in grades K through 3 is limited to situations now where a student is likely to cause serious physical harm uh, to other students or staff. Uh, districts must compile statistics and also withholding or delaying meals is prohibited. So what prompted these changes? You know, um, first of all, I hope if you ever meet my wife, I want you two to have that conversation of what you guys were like in school, please. Um, but with that said, uh, I think the stakeholders that approached me that convinced me of, of this issue were those that said um, denying um, getting out on the playground and expelling all this energy is not the solution when a kid misbehaves and want, we need to punish them. And um, I, I just think it's, it made sense to me that letting the kids go out to recess and, and getting rid of all that energy is the right thing to do for a kid that's acting up and not putting that, letting all the kids go out to recess in the, the jungle gym, if that's even a thing anymore. And, um, and then Johnny has to stay behind because he misbehaved. That doesn't make any intellectual sense to me, so. Uh, another change families will notice has to do with active shooter drills. The new law includes definitions, parameters, and limits. Uh, for the simulations, including a uh, parental notification requirement, the opportunity for families to opt their children out, and a prohibition on elements like simulated gunshots or blood that make these drills feel real. That said, the state will continue to require schools have lockdown drills. So what's the reason for the change? Yeah, we have, I believe, five drills a year, tornadoes um, and um, fires, and now... Um, Lockdown drills. Lockdown drills for um, our schools. And, you know, the, the, I think I've told you this before, but the weirdest, saddest moment for me as a teacher were those times I'd walk back into a classroom after passing time, you know, pre-cell phones maybe, and, and I had to announce to the class, um, we had another school shooting today in fill in the blank. And the looks on my students' faces, I wished I had a hidden camera once because their looks are like, can't you grown-ups deal with this and I'm not here today to suggest what what I think is the solution but I hope um, um, you're much younger um, for to maybe remember this but those lockdowns um, duck and cover drills I, I had in kindergarten and first grade um, and now when I tell students about that they laugh and I hope young teachers today 20 years from now when they describe the lockdown drills and simulations um, they, they, the kids laugh and go, well, what were those like? Because we don't need them anymore because we fixed it. It's a con it's, I, I do agree that um, kids should be allowed to, parents should be allowed to opt out, so that's a good thing. But um, it's sad that we've come to this state of affairs that um, that's another drill we need to have for our kids. But uh, what was the question? Uh, just, just the reason for the change. But oh, we're, we're close yeah. to time, so okay. if you could just briefly Sorry. give me a topic. 
that for sure you plan to bring up in the next legislative okay. well, session? Okay, well first, let me tell you the thing I'm proudest of from the last session isn't civics and personal finance, it's menstrual equity. That this school year, every young um, um, person between the ages of fourth and twelfth grade will have menstrual products available for them in our schools. But the thing I want to work hardest on this next session, a couple things come to mind. School discipline issues, our, our, our kids, another, I think, the thing that came out of COVID was um, was kids forgot maybe a little bit how to act civilly um, civ with civility in front of the adults. So I, I, I want to do school discipline. I want to do um, a lot more for um, um, our, our, our kids' mental health. And then ultimately, I think the impending crisis of our generation may be a teacher shortage. And, um, and I know we spent some good money this last session on helping teachers choose that career, but I think we can do more. Senator Steve Swazinski. Thank you. Thank you. The Legislative Task Force on Aging met for the first time in late August to begin their work to review and develop state resources for an aging demographic. Taking care of our aging Minnesotans and being a voice for them at the Capitol has become a top priority for me. Um, I think I said on the floor last year uh, in the Senate, uh, <laughs> some people go fishing or golfing as their hobby. I like to visit nursing homes and assisted living across their state and check in and see how everybody's doing. So. Uh, definitely want to address um, affordable housing. I've heard that's a, a big issue on our seniors' minds, and the health care and the staff in these nursing homes to make sure that um, we can keep them um, open for places for our seniors to stay. And over the last 30-some years, I have felt uh, reasonably assured that that work had been done and that we were moving in a good direction. But um, over the past several years, as I've looked more and more uh, deeply into some of the aging issues, I have realized that we need exactly what we have here with the task force, which is an opportunity to review and evaluate where we are, what is working well, and what do we need to still put our energy to to make sure that Minnesota can be a place for all Minnesotans to age well and to live well. What's important, well, to me, um, affordable housing, being able to live in my own home, um, having af affordable home care, um, staffing shortages that's, that's come up, that, those are the big things with me, and I hear that from a lot of my people in MCD. I have sat on many uh, statewide uh, initiatives, for example, in dementia and other, where, and other types of uh, uh, of efforts that have created wonderful reports, excellent recommendations. There is never any follow-up in terms of metrics of success on those recommendations or whether they've been implemented successfully. And I think when I look at the landscape of aging in the state of Minnesota and where we need to go next to advance our work, it's yes, we can identify needs. But can we I then identify, okay, what are the strategies to implement and address these needs and then track to ensure that they're being uh, successfully addressed and then sustained. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.